How are you? Very good. Where are you based, actually? I'm based in Spain. Not too far from you. You are based in France, right? Exactly. Which city are you in Spain? It's called Coruña. It's in the north in Galicia, close to Portugal. Oh, yes, of course. I think I played there for a big festival like back in the days, maybe 10 years ago. Yeah, during the summer, there are many festivals here. You can find electronic music, but also rock. There is a big heavy metal one. So, yeah, it's a good place for actually for concerts and, and festivals. Podemos hablar español si quieres. <laughs> Muy bien. Hablas español y francés. Un poquito. Inglés. Nice. And you're on tour right now. Actually, thanks for taking the time. I was looking at your schedule. Where is the next? This yeah. week is very cool. I'm based this week, the whole week in Paris. So that's why it was very convenient for me this week. I'm playing in Paris this week in a festival named Electric Park. The summer has been quite intense. And actually, that's also why I'm releasing all the drops now. Because then in October, I will be off. <laughs> When everybody will be back to work, I will be off, actually. Nice, nice. Yeah, you work hard during the summer, right? That's when DJs have a lot of concerts. Actually, many... it's both true and false because the summer is everywhere on the planet at the moment of the year. So the DJs are constantly traveling where the summer is. So then... Now they will go to South America, to Mexico, then it will be Asia. There is always a moment where we can party with sun and it's always a summer somewhere. If the artist doesn't want to say, okay, guys, I did enough and I need to rest a bit for my health, then they can keep playing nonstop three, four times a week the whole year if they wanted. Yeah, so you can actually, I mean, that's good and bad. It's good because you can basically work anytime, but also... On the opposite side, you could work all the time, so you can work non-stop. I didn't know about that. That's an interesting fact. Um, so you will be off in October after your tour, and you had a bunch of collections as well. So you will get your holiday. How do you take some time off, Agoria? You're doing concerts, playing shows. So what do you do during your holidays? Nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. I have the chance to have an amazing family. And I was the kind of artist who was, who was touring constantly. So recently I did a space with Blondich and, and she was telling that she was doing five gigs in a row and she was just, just speaking a few minutes on, on a space. And that reminds me, it reminds me how I was also playing back in the days. It's great till you're 40, let's say. Also till you have a single life. It's very complicated to organize an artist's life. I mean... A DJing, life touring every city in the world and having a family waiting for you is something very difficult to achieve. Very few artists managed. And I guess now that I, I have the chance to have my private life well balanced, I don't want to ruin this. So obviously, I tour less and I feel much better, to be honest, because it's really demanding to play every night and traveling the day, playing the night, playing, traveling the dates. It looks very nice, of course, in terms of fame, of image and blah, blah, blah. But the price for this for your health and, and your body is really difficult. So to many artists, I'm also advising sometimes to take it a bit more easy. Yeah, of course, I, I can imagine it. Also playing at night, it messes up with your schedule. Because when you play, usually at what time do you play, Agoria? It depends, I guess, but most of the time is past 11 p.m. So you end the show after 1, 2, 2 a.m., am I right? So if you want the glamour life, let me tell you. So you will land around 9, 10 p.m. in the city. You will run to the hotel. You will sleep two, three hours. You will get up at 2 a.m. And at 3 a.m. you will be on stage to play till 5 or 6. Then you're back to the hotel at 7. And then from 7 to 11, you sleep. And then you take a plane. That's basically the classic life because we are not like rock bands playing from 8 or 9 to 11, we play by night, really late. And on top of this, the jet lag, most of the time is kind of heavy. When you see some DJs during the summer doing, I don't know, let's say Los Angeles, Los Angeles, Mykonos, Mykonos, South Africa, South Africa, Ibiza, every week, it's insane. It's very difficult. I'm not saying that we are forced to do this. I'm not complaining. I think it's an amazing life. I travel the whole world. I meet so many people, so many things that I discovered, cities, cultures, very inspiring. It's a fantastic life, but then you need to be ready for the healthy price to pay for that. Yeah, I can imagine. And Gloria, you started DJing in the 90s. When did you start to travel and play 
was it like immediately it took you several years how were the beginnings of your musician career it totally changed the last 25 years when i started to play nobody was looking at me when i was on stage and where we were playing parties every djs were playing but the audience were not looking at the artist they were dancing on their own with group of people and they were not like this kind of fame star thing of being on stage everyone watching and filming you non-stop constantly it was very different there were not this kind of overabundance of djs playing everywhere so we were really playing 100 kilometer around your city for the five first years And then after that, when I started to release my first album and records, then I started to play between Berlin and London. Some DJs like Laurent Garnier, DJ Hell, were speaking loudly about my music. Then I started to play in the US, in Tokyo and everywhere. But it has been very progressive. It took me maybe 10, 12 years to play the whole world. So it has not been something very fast. Whereas nowadays, I think if you do a hit, you play the whole world the next week. So it has been very very different from now. When I started, <laughs> I was saying this the other day in an interview, when I started, when my ex-girlfriend introduced me to my step family, they were all uh, a bit like, oh really? Are you dating a DJ? Are you crazy? Are you really dating a DJ? My daughter, are you silly? What are you doing? And nowadays, <laughs> if you go saying you're a DJ, it's like, oh, my daughter, you're fantastic. What amazing choice you did nowadays. It really changed a lot. And There are good and bad aspects, of course, of this. But... Why were the families or people had this sort of image of DJs back in the days? What has changed? Is it because now you can find popular DJs that have a very popular no, I think, career? I think it was, at that time, it was forbidden. Electronic music was forbidden. They were like in London, the criminal justice bill were telling, you can't dance more than two people on repetitive music, otherwise you will be arrested. I was organizing parties, rave parties, then I organized a big festival in my hometown named Nuit Sonore that I co-founded maybe 20 years ago almost to help this to be developed. But at that time, it was impossible to make parties. I was ending at the police station every month because I was <laughs> keep playing at 6 a.m. and I was the only DJ staying. And so the police picked me up to bring me to the police station. After a while, they knew who I was, so it was fine. But we were really identified as drug dealers and unbrained people, I guess. Sometimes I do the comparison with the web free when there is a lot of controversy. There is a lot of people who try to ban what we are doing about the regulation, even if I think regulation is definitely needed. But there are a lot of things that are very similar. So that's why I also think web free and all our passion are like kind of the following of what I experienced when I started with ref parties. It's kind of freedom space that we needed. That's why I embraced so much this period and also why I spent so much time even tonight here with you because we are like just at the foundations of something that we have no clue where it will go and it's beautiful. When I started to be a DJ, I never guessed that I would be a DJ for 25 years. I would do this for two years or three years and then maybe I will have another life. But so it's fantastic just to create and compose with technology nowadays. Even if you have many oracles who can predict any single coin uh, graphic or any single NFT graphic or any single artist carry or whatever, nobody knows. That's the beauty, I think, of it. You define it pretty well. And also the sentiment around the digital art or the crypt space in general, Web3, as they say, when there is a revolutionary technology, there is always going to be some rejection and not necessarily a technology, like a new trend that it's very different and i guess that's as you said is what happened with electronic music Gloria, what kept you going during the early days you said it was very hard to organize parties it was related to drug dealing and it was basically legal so what kept you going during those years i think what something is forbidden it gets even more attractive so when you had to go to an info line to find where the party would have been located. There is just a flyer in a record shop, you find it, you have an info line, you call this info line, and then there is in two minutes, 200 cars in the same place and trying to find the party of the rave, something that is really fundamental. And same a bit here, we are like today, very few at this Twitter space, but I love that actually. I love to be intimate thing where we are only passionate people, where we create foundations on something that People will have no clue about all what we had to achieve to make it. When I create the festival in Risenor, 
actually it was with the um, ex prime minister of France named uh, Gérard Collomb. At that time, it was he was the mayor of the city, and to convince him to organize a festival in my hometown to bring all the youth people and to attract people all over the France and abroad to dance on electronic music. I organized one night with him in all the bars of my city. The city is Lyon, it's in the middle of France, center of France. And in every bar, I organized a meeting with artists of my city. So you had like house DJs, drum and bass DJs, poets, dancers, light people, VGs. Every single artist of the city organized a meeting. After the night, like it was 2 or 3 a.m., we were all drunk, but the prime minister, Georges Colomb, I guess he's used as a politic man to drink, so <laughs> he was perfectly fine. And he said, okay, guys, I see your motivation. We will make it. So just because we organize this and we federate everyone, then the whole city was behind us, and they, they gave us locations, a bit of money to organize this, and this festival is now 20 years old, and it's like uh, maybe 120,000 people. When we started, we were 2,000 in five days, and it's already 120,000. So the story is long, there's no rush, and we should just like take the time to build these solid foundations. That's a great story. How did you meet this minister from France? In a party, or how did you meet him? Actually, they, they wanted to do... No, not in a party. <laughs> he was not in a party dance in front of me. But they wanted to do something for the city, and when you're really authentic and when you speak loud about things and, of course, politics want to meet you. I think it's his cabinet, his secretary, when they called me, saying we want to do something for the youth generation of our city. Lyon is like one million of people living. And so they invited me to a breakfast at the Meyer place. And then we started to decide together what we wanted to do. It could have been a party with uh, David Guetta, Bob Sinclair and kind of uh, more commercial artists. Or it could have been a rock and salsa party. I guess they saw that we were so motivated, so desperate. Also, we were very desperate because most of the promoters were losing money every party they were doing because of the police coming, because of uh, many reasons. So they say, okay, I think they trusted us because we were not actually drug dealers. We were not totally decerebrated people. So they trusted us and they say, okay, we're going to help you. And the good thing that my partner at that time named Vincent organizes to sign a deal to make it for three years. They had to uh, subside us for three years, which helped us to start nicely, I guess. This story reminds me actually that in the Web3 space, in generative art or art in general, you can find many artists from France and you can see many initiatives. I was at NFT Paris a few months ago, and there were people from the government visiting and, and checking the exhibition, checking what's the NFT movement. I guess it's because the, the strong history of France related to art, from what I perceive, they are in general in France very open to these new trends and whatever is happening that's related to art, that's related to creative stuff. That's what I see. Do you feel the same since you have been in many countries, many cities? Do you think that's true? Actually, the country is a bit weird because I think the social networks is a bit killing the um, culture of every country, trying to make every country look kind of similar. So um, I'm glad that you still say that. And I'm glad that you see that, uh, for example, the First Lady of France went to NFT Paris and also ministers. But in a way, I think uh, we still have to take care and, and be careful about our culture and about making art very important in the development of civilizations. I think it's, we're in a country where it's still very important, but I don't think we should take it for granted. That's a, a good point. That's a, the thing about globalization. As you said, everything looks kind of similar. And yeah, we shouldn't take it for granted. That's an important thing to keep in mind. And Agoria, coming back now, let's maybe talk a bit about your art and how do you manage to create art and create music and tour and do all these things? You also have different kinds of art, different kinds of projects. You are involved in festivals. You are involved in different initiatives. How do you manage yourself these days? I tour less <laughs> so I can do more art. No, but I guess the more you do, the more you can achieve this experience all my life, that the more you are surrounded with people uh, were like really, let's say, pushing you and motivating you. I have an amazing team around me 
amazing people around me were really like mind blowing. And so it's a big source of inspiration. I started to do art, actually not art. I was doing the sound for Philippe Pareno, which is a fantastic contemporary artist in France and abroad. We did many exhibitions like in the Tate Modern, in Momai, New York, Amoy Park, where he had like huge holy for his own exhibitions. I started to, to learn a lot with him. It was very impactful for me, the way he was working. And I started then to actually merge all the people I have around me. It could be scientists, it could be philosophers, it could be coders, it could be all kinds of people. And started to brainstorm with all of them. And then they all say, okay, Seb, you should maybe try to launch your own art now. So I started to do photos all over the world. Then the pandemic arrives, I started to do videos and then embrace all what was AI and possibilities of the blockchain. But it's something that was also in a response of, I think, the music industry who is really repeating all the bad things that the social networks are helping to make. So I think the art setting, especially digital art, is really something refreshing. It's really something that is totally virgin, where everything is still authentic, in my opinion, and every artist is fully embarked in his own vision and in his own discipline. I think it's fantastic. And my time is kind of little, but... I guess I get organized very well with my touring to do many things. So I think it's the reason why I can make so much. But I will take one month off afterwards. I will have more time to <laughs> think. And so I will bring even more projects because actually the best idea you have is when you stop working and when you let your body relaxing for, let's say, 10 days, two weeks, then it, you fuel with so many things coming to you. But you can't decide where it's coming from, the inspiration. There is absolutely no rules. For example, my studio is always all plugged. Not good for the electricity of the planet, I agree, but it's very few. But it's always plugged. So sometimes the time to plug something, if you have a, a machine, a software, a computer that is not working correctly, then it could kill your vibe. So it's always plugged any minute of the day. But the inspiration can come just like for a talk with a friend. I can start a track thinking, okay, I will do Something about, we start with a bass line and then I will do a piano thing that will have nothing mattering with what I thought. Or, for example, for the Bohemia drop I did at Scorpius, I thought about the owner of the place. And just because I met the owner, I was playing for his birthday last year, then we speak about chorale, we speak about the danger of the ecosystem, and then it, it gives the birth of my drop. There is so many different aspects of it. Right. I see actually there is Sasha style listening. And so congrats, Sasha, for all what you're doing. And I want to say one thing is there is a poem from Stéphane Malamé, which I think it was like um, end of the um, 20th century, uh, 19th century, who is a fantastic poet, an amazing one. The poem is, I don't know the word in English, I'm very sorry, I can share with a few ones if they want. It's like, un jet de un jet de day jamais n'abolira le hasard. It's a captain in a boat about to fail on the ocean and he has these in the hand and he doesn't know what to decide and this poem the structure the way it's written it's a code by itself and it's a fantastic one and i think it has been one of my main inspiration maybe the last two or three years for example yeah it's great to see sasha in the audience she was in the podcast a few sessions a few episodes ago so if you want to learn more about sasha and her NFT poetry, mixing it up with AI. It's fantastic. You can check out the list of episodes. And by the way, we are recording, for those in the audience that don't know, we are recording this live here in the Twitter space. And after this, I will share the recording in the podcasting platforms and my newsletter. So if you missed the beginning, or if you cannot stay here for the whole hour, you can always go back to the, the podcasting platforms and listen it whenever you have time. And Agoria, that's amazing what you're mentioning. I mean, where you find inspiration, you also mentioned that you started actually making art after collaborating with so many uh, artists and helping collaborating with them to exhibitions, to do exhibitions at the Tate, at the MoMA. You started with photography and video. I was wondering, when did you have this idea of a biological generative art, which is that's kind of a unique style that you have found? When did you get that idea, that inspiration, and how did that happen? So during the pandemic, there is a friend of mine who is a gallerist in Paris, and she asked me to play for the seeding of a, a hemp field. So it's the brother cannabis, 
and it was a plantation of hemp. And she asked me if I wanted to play for the seeding for them. And I say, well, you know, I did actually rave parties all my childhood, as I said at the beginning of this podcast. So I was not really interested by that. But I say, if you want me to think about the art project about this hemp field, I would be so glad to think about this. So um, I contacted two friends of mine. One is Nicolas Becker, who got the Oscar for fantastic movie of I think two or three years ago about a, a drummer that got death on tour I, I really recommend this this movie is fantastic one of my good friend biophysicist who is Nicolas Depra he worked at the CNRS is like a responsible of national research about all what's touching biophysics and physicing so together I started to think about what we could do and I came up with the idea of doing hemp radio so 24 7 we could listen the language of this of this field we built a software program to make listenable the sound of it so to make it not just right noise and just frequencies but to work on how to we could interpret the moving of this hemp field during the days and the weeks just one night it has been broken because the farmer that he break the cables under the ground with his work. It has been online for like maybe a year and a half and we stopped it and I think I should replug it to my website, but it was a good project. And then we did a movie about this. So we took uh, Echantillon, how do we say Echantillon? Let's say like the seeds of the fields and we studied this in the laboratory of my friend Nicolas. He built a microscope for that and we developed the sitting for like maybe three months but the first two months we didn't see anything that was really appealing and one night he called me back he said wow say we found something Seb so I went to the laboratory and we developed all the work about fluorescence and about the growth of the microorganism of this field and all this process this three months or four months process make me learn so much about the living and I found so much comp things that I didn't know about the power of the living that I wanted to merge all what we could use as AI tools or coding and to merge this with the living. I think the living is the most complex system, is the most clever system. Elon Musk said one day that speaking with a tree will be like speaking with a child for AI. I think it's a fantastic compliment. Even if in his mouth it was like terrible, because for him it was saying we are just very stupid compared to AI. Of course, he was also very provocative here. But in my opinion, speaking with trees and speaking with the living and trying to understand that is absolutely incredible. What I love about this first piece we did, that it's a movie of eight minutes that it's named Phytosem. We see things that even at the laboratory they didn't know what it was. So about uh, art idea, we develop uh, tools and we develop a narrative that actually the output was really something that they never saw before. So it's really exciting as an artist also to see the questions we can have as an artist can also be question shared with uh, scientists. We don't know if it will be a scientist research. I don't think so because to make a, a scientific publication, there is so many rules that you need to make perfect to make sure that Nothing has perturbed the, the research. But I love also to think about NFT or digital art as a possibility, as a medium for the scientists. Yeah, the space where we are is basically the intersection between technology and art. So what I love about it is on one side, we have creatives, we have the free minds, the bohemians. And on the other side, as you said, we have more like the scientists, the geeks, the nerds, the computer nerds. And it's that intersection what makes this is space for interesting, in my opinion. Also, I want to say that the scientists might be the craziest because they have the craziest ideas, but they need to be inside the borders that the protocols of the science like force them to be. I think it's normal that there are protocols. Even if they have like so much intuition, as artists, we have a lot of intuition and no protocols. They have both the intuition and the protocol. So it's fantastic. And the more I met... Scientists, the more I'm like, I feel stupid. <laughs> I feel I know nothing and I just want to know more and more and more. So the Free to Send movie was just the very first one I did. And, and then I did this project named Centriol where my idea was to look for what I had in my mind before it came to my mind. So just like thinking, okay, if we are machines, what push our ideas to reveal our ideas? I went to speak with a biologist and we actually did a series named Centriol where we can see the seeding of our ideas in our brains. 
I think it's just beautiful because it's also for old people who are, feel very guilty and confident or even people who are so arrogant and sure of themselves that actually, well, there are very few that we can control. It's really beautiful. I think but, it, we are very little. But can you explain a bit about that? That sounds very interesting. So how did you look at the spots in the brain that generated the ideas before they actually came to your mind? Is that right? Yeah, I did it with a biologist named Alice Meunier. She would kid me to say it this way, but it could be interpreted like that. In the brain, we have like a, a liquid and we have like cilia, and the cilia are pushing the proteins in this liquid. So what's happening is like every time proteins are matching together, then your brain is activating something. So it could be an idea, it could be a movement, could be something else. But before these cilia appear, we have what we call cilia. And the centriole is something that is under the cilia and pushing the cilia. So even before there is this cilia movement in your brain, in the liquid to make the proteins attached to each other and to decide something, there is this centriole that is the birth of everything. And actually, if you look at what is a centriole, it looks like the cosmos, which is incredible. It could be really something like a stars in the air. And yes, I think it's something that we can't say exactly how the process has been between this centriole movement, the centriole force and strength and your own decision. Let's say that it's the premise of your decision. You're quite the scientist now. You can explain that pretty well. <laughs> well uh, no, no, I think she would kid me, honestly. I think <laughs> I said it as a caricature, but let's say that the, the big lines are, are like that. Yeah, no, that's amazing. Are you actually using this already in your creation set or is it something you're building, trying to incorporate? Well, I use so many things on myself, on my own body, from shaman, from brainwaves, from magnetism. I think I did all the experiences as I could do so far till the next, <laughs> till the next doctor will call me saying, hey, we have something we want to test on you, Seb. But no, I'm really keen to test all these things. I think the, the most perturbating for me has been the shamanism. It's something that I will keep private because I think what you have in your own session should keep private. But I think it's the most powerful thing I, I never had. And actually, it's a shaman that actually teach me to indulge trance on myself. This is the most incredible uh, thing I have for someone who is like me at the beginning, who was really a control freak activating things just to make me think that, yeah, well, <laughs> we see absolutely nothing with our eyes, that it's something that has been the most uh, challenging and perturbating for me. It feels the way you explain it. I feel like it has a big influence in your music and in your art. What you just uh, mentioned about doing these sessions with shamans and playing with trying things on your body. Is that the case? Do you think that experimentation translate directly into your electronic music, into your art, where you think? I think the compendia and the compendia I say is are really influenced by all the shamanic experiences I could have, because I think I would have never been open to see it if I didn't do this own experiences on myself. I would have been blind to it. The fact that I opened some, let's say, some sensors, then I could realize that has something in, incredible in front of me. and. Unless I did this experience, I would have never picked it. So yes, of course, it's all a matter about be open. It doesn't need to be something extraordinary. It can be something very subtle or very cliche sometimes also. But just like the beauty of it, you need to be able to accept it and you need to be able to digest it, actually. I'm very lucky I did this. And I think for so many people struggling for various reasons, it could be the fantastic and absolutely incredible experience for all of them. I see many people who are trying to do cosmic experiences with ayahuasca or this kind of thing. I think it's a wrong choice. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying it's a wrong choice to start with that such hard experiences because ayahuasca is something that is so strong that it will develop skills that you think you will have like too fast. You need to understand the power of it. You need to understand the strength of it and what you can access with it, but not with artificial or too fast tools, let's say. Okay, so let's say 
somebody like me. I haven't. But I'm not here to guide anyone in, uh, <laughs> in shaman. It was not the topic of this podcast, <laughs> Keroa. Yeah. Just because you pushed me in some questions, so I'm answering. But that's it's something to take it very precautiously. Right, right. No, no. I, I think sometimes the conversation goes in interesting paths, but at the same time. I think it's interesting to get into the minds of creative persons like yourself, where you have shown a long career in electronic music from when it was illegal, and you've been around, produced four albums, and now... You know, I five... started this podcast saying I was not a drug dealer, and now you <laughs> let me speak about shamanism. So, well, sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, that's very funny. But the point is that I'm very interested in how your mind works and where you find the inspiration. And in your case, I think you had this career in music and now you are breaking into this new space and you now have been doing it. You have a strong collector space. It's similar, but at the same time, it's very different when you think about DJing and creating digital art. I think actually it's very similar. Also about the community and the collectors. Because when I was playing in the rave parties, I was like with maybe 50, 100 people in front of me at the beginning. And that was far enough. And I was knowing absolutely everyone. And I loved it because it was a party with friends in the end. We did so many things all together. And I think it's the same thing with the Web3. It's very circular. It's very positive. There is no one artist at the top of it and collectors under it. We are all at the same level. And I'm a collector myself and I love it. This is why I love this space. You can get to know everyone and there is no one who is stronger, no one who is more important than the other. And everyone is part of this circle and everyone is of his own piece for this circle. So I think it's, my collectors did so much for me, but that's also why I do this avatar collection on Sandbox because of course I'm not a PFP boy and I'm not into collectibles and all these things. But in a way, it was fantastic to organize this and think about that. Because this community has been doing so much for me that it's also something that is questioning. But identities, we were speaking about the fact we could have like different bodies, different lives. I see in the nightlife that you can see the true self of people by night, where everyone thinks they are by day themselves. I think they are all themselves by night, because by night there is no boss, there is no woman, no man, your boyfriend or girlfriend are not here, or if they are here, they are also in another mood. And so you're not judged, you're not a spy, you can be really yourself by night. And I really think about the fact that this space also helps people to have an identity that is their true self. I can feel artists, of course, but collectors. And when I meet collectors in parties, I see how much they are impacted by all this space. And the fact that this space has been uh, down for one year and a half. I think the people who are here are just the best and they are just incredibly motivated. They are just incredibly helpful. We are in a fantastic, to be honest, I'm not happy that people lost money, of course, but I'm really happy that for now, all the people who are here are just to develop the best of the art and the best of this space. It's mind blowing for me. Yeah, it's about finding your crowd, finding your people. And yeah, I agree with what you said. I'm, for example, my readers, my community, I'm very excited about that community because i mean we chat sometimes about the prices the money etc but it's mostly about supporting artists discovering new artists understanding the stories behind the art and for me that's also what's exciting having these conversations having people like you on the stage like sasha who is in the audience and understanding where the inspiration comes from so as you said now the people that are around are like-minded, right? That's what they are here for. And I was wondering, Seb, the audience you created in the space that you mentioned are so supporting of your work and your collectors, is that a new audience that you developed over the last two years or were they already following you as a DJ or are they new fans? Do you know? Have you chatted with them? Did they know you from before or after you started to create digital art? I, I chat with them nonstop <laughs> and I learned a lot about them and we do so much. But I was really shocked recently that so much of my colleagues start to speak uh, open and frankly and say, we had no clue you were doing music, Seb. <laughs> and I think it was fantastic. I love the fact that most of the people who, who are now embarked in this are now starting to listening my music maybe. And maybe if they start to listen to the music I was doing 25 years ago, they would say, oh, wow, you were really hardcore, Seb. When nowadays, of course, with my age, 
now 47 i do like music that is more um, accommodant let's say more nice when i started i was playing 150 bpm maybe or something like this in rave parties and uh, most of the collectors no had no clue that uh, i was doing music but one thing i love i did like few twitter groups and I love the fact that sometimes I'm saying, okay, I'm playing here this weekend. If someone is here, just let me know and I invite you on stage. So they come to the festival on stage and I have very good moments with them. And so they are discovering also what is the electronic music community. And the force of it is like, same as the digital art, it's universal. There is no language barrier, no language problems. We don't need to explain why we love it. People understand each other in the crowd and they know how to react and they know how to behave in the good parties. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but it's a bit like that. These communities are really strong for that. I'm not looking forward to some people think, okay, we need more and more and more people. Okay, for sure we need a bit more. But I don't think the success is to be the most hyped and the most demanded artist. I was starting this podcast saying, I'm so happy nowadays I play less than before just because I feel better and I can do more things where I was a kid. I wanted to play four or five times a week. And same as I think as a digital artist, sometimes we're doing like five drops a week. And I think, do you really need to do five drops a week? Some might need. And again, I'm not judging because I'm in very comfortable place and situation. So I'm not here to judge artists and everyone can do whatever they want. If they want to do open edition, 100, 10, 1. 20 on zero one by day or whatever, everyone can do what he wants. And that's also the beauty of it and the decentralization of it. Recently, people were asking me about my feeling about OpenSea also, about the royalties and the, all this thing. And I think people always tend to have a global view and global critique to be like, it's right or wrong. But most of the time it's much more subtle than this. It's very difficult to say, okay, for the artist, you should do once a month and that's all, or once a week and that's all. There are so many different stories, so many different also career aspects that we can't have a rule for everyone. Same with the royalties, I think. Yeah, you said so many things. Let's let's recap. Uh, first, I didn't know you were 47. You look much younger. I'm 33 and I think you look younger than me, uh, Seb, to be honest. That's the shamanism. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Also, I discovered your music through your art. I'm one of those. So I actually discovered your biological art, generative art. That's how I got to know you. And from there, I started to research and then, oh, so he's a DJ. I started to look at your music. So what this tells me is that actually some people are afraid to create art and actually connect uh, this identity to their real world professional for example but sometimes that actually is positive like in your case but i mean you were doing something that's kind of related right to art so it was not a, a drastic change but nevertheless i think many people will learn from this and yeah the main thing is tough as you said uh, how much should you make well, just one little thing about what you said all my career people say seb you need to focus on one thing and i think it's such a wrong advice even if everybody will tell you you need to focus because I think when you focus, you're also closing yourself to so many inspirations, so many ideas. When you don't focus, I'm not saying just to do like 200 things, but let's just a little bit more open to all disciplines, different disciplines. I was speaking of working with philosophers or scientists, or also now we work with an hospital. And I think these things are like really inspiring. And if I was only doing techno music since I was 20, I would be lobotomized today. So maybe I'm a bit lobotomized still, but I mean, in a good way now. Right. That's, that's interesting. And how did you select the, the projects for the different things you were going to do? The ones that you are just more passionate about? Is that, is that how you do it? I think your brain chose for you. There is few studies actually at the moment who are like showing how your brain react to different kind of climates and different kind of situations. And the way it reacts actually show that the more it's pushed in different variations, then the more it develop tools and abilities. I don't think I choose myself. There's something happening that I'm not able to decide. But at the same time, if you start working on a song or on a new piece or like your wearables and your avatars now with Sandbox, at some point, you need to complete those songs, that music, that album, that collection. So in these collections, the one I have seen from you, this avatar collection, your albums, this take 
time to finish. So how do you stay focused to finish these projects, but at the same time explore new things, new disciplines? You are just free, but at the same time, you need to finish something. How do you push yourself to finish projects? How do you handle that balance? I think the first thing, a project is never finished never finished. I did a song actually like two or three years ago on my website where I did this with a company named Bronze. They are from UK where they develop AI tools that we will do many projects next year with them. I didn't want to speak today about this, but I think it's a good thing to know. They develop new way to make music with generative possibilities and AI possibilities. I did a project with them three years ago where every time you press play, my song wouldn't have been the same. So nobody would have listened the same song. I did a song named What If The Dead Dreams with Ella Minus, the Colombian singer. And it's on Spotify. There is my own version for it. And on my website, you can listen every time you first play a new version of it. So it's very difficult to speak about a song when nobody listens the same song. And the fact that it's a perpetual song, that it's written, even myself, I don't know what's going to happen if you're going to have the lyrics, it will start with an intro, with the beats. And I love the fact that it questions also the finality of your art, because we always have a big ego thinking, okay, we know this is the end. At the moment, for sure, we are convinced about our final cut, and we are convinced that we did the good work to make it good. It's fine, I think. We don't need to make sure that's the best output. If we are just happy emotionally with it, and if we think it's great, then I'm happy with it. But to answer more precisely, it helped me to work much faster. Doing more projects helped me to do faster and faster because it's so very fast when it's good or not to your ears or to your eyes, and you can elect. You can say, okay, now I'm done with it. The fact of if I do a song, then I need to check outputs of art then, of course, I stop the song. And then when I come back with fresh ears, I can know very fast, I guess, faster than if I was like just constantly listening to it to improve uh, this frequency or this bass line or whatever. So it's actually a good tool to refresh your ears or your eyes and your mind with different projects. Yeah, that's a great point. In your case, as you said, it feels like it works perfectly. You switch between music to visual outputs and that way you kind of regain your energy. That's a very interesting step. I had a few questions that I don't want to finish this conversation without asking. So what are the best parties in the world, Agoria, that you have been? <laughs> <laughs> the best parties in the world are, are with your friends. There is no question. Wherever you are, if you are with your friends, you will have the best party. And if you want to experience culture, I think Tokyo is fantastic. And Japan in general is fantastic because I was speaking about the avatars, one life, two bodies. I think it's exactly what's happening in Japan. By day, they are very controlled, very serious, very protocol, very well-educated. And by night, they're all going fucking crazy, incredibly crazy. It, it looks like they are animals and they are different person. And it's the best party ever. I think Tokyo is fantastic. Brazil is amazing too. All South America is fantastic. And... Irish and Scottish people, they know how to party and it's over at 2 or 3 a.m. So it's perfect for me now, but it, they are just amazing party to do. Since you're from Spain, Kelo, we know that the best European festival is Sonar Festival and it's in Barcelona and, and I played there like maybe six, seven times every two, three years I go there and it's a fantastic festival. I think where we can discover amazing artists, I had the chance this year to be there and I listened for, I don't know, for the 10th time, maybe Apex Twin and it was the best live act I saw in my life. It was like 40 minutes of, I don't know how you manage this, of an incredible crescendo with nothing that was out of taste. And it was so difficult to achieve technically. I think it's really a genius. What's the name of the festival? Sonar Festival. And the performance was from FX Twin, you said? Yeah. Okay. By the way, everybody listening, if you don't know any of the collections that is mentioning or the festival... All those will be included in the description. So you can look at the episode notes to look for those. I know you have been to many, let's call them NFT events, art events, shows. You've played in many of those. Which ones have surprised you? Because it's not so long since these events started to be created, similar to what you mentioned with your parties and the event you organized in France. So far, two, three years since this all started, which events I love do you the, think are really good? As a party or as a conference, you mean? 
uh, both your experience going there to have a good time in general. I really liked the uh, NFC in Lisbon this year. I think it was really great and they did a good job with all the screens and it was not just people sitting and people listening. I really liked it. We also had a little uh, party there and it was really cool. I think this conference was really interesting. I love the Glitch residency that is not really a conference but it's a meeting between artists. Once a year that Primavera the Philippines organizing it's a fantastic meeting point. I think my biggest challenge this year was to speak at the uh, United Nations. It was in Riyadh, where they invited me to speak about Metaverse and Web3. And I went down from stage because it was with President, Minister, the Sheikh and everyone. And I was on stage and I say, well, to explain you what is Web3, let me go down from stage. And I went sitting through all these guests from United Nations, explaining them what was Web3. I was at that time showing on the screen the Hempfield movie. So it was in, in Riyadh, in Arabi, Saudi Arabia, so it was kind of challenging. But I'm really, <laughs> really happy I helped to do this. I was not really comfortable to speak on conference because it's the same with the films. When you film, you don't play as good as when you just listened. It's fine for me to speak in a podcast, but I always think when people film you in a conference or film you when you're on stage, it's very different of people are just here for the moment. So, yeah. I don't know if I answered the question, actually, but yes. And FC Lisbon was cool. I really liked it. No, that's fantastic. I didn't know you had that experience. That's quite interesting. So you were explaining the metaverse and Web3 to all these diplomats. That's very interesting. What you just said about speaking. But do you think that all those years doing shows, DJing, you are not really speaking there, but people are looking at you. They are looking at you. What's the difference between that, a show in a party, and uh, speaking at another place when you feel nervous more than performing or maybe you are also nervous while you perform is, is that the case yeah i do i'm still nervous it depends for example last weekend i did a show in scorpios mykonos i was not really nervous much because it's i know this place and they are all here for the music but the day after i played in a festival in france it was thirty thousand people the lineup was really eclectic before me was Louis attack and like a f rock band and after me it was DJ Snake. Very different audiences. It was very stressful to play in front of 30,000 people who are not here especially for your music. So you need to convince them some way that they should join our communities. I did a lot of conference and talking on stage this year and I'm fine to speak on panel and I'm fine to do keynotes but as soon as I see that it, there is a captation it's getting more tricky. No, that's perfectly understandable that would be the case and since you've been in the early days of electronic music, you saw how all that developed. You've been also in the early days of this NFT as a distribution to digital art. What do you think is more challenging these days? Being a DJ when you started and have a career as a DJ or being a digital artist and try to have a career? Which one is more challenging from your experience? I will answer in two points. I would say it's um, very difficult to be a DJ today because I think unless you have a lot of money, five people who are coming with you on stage filming and if you're good on social media, I mean, okay, maybe you'll make it, but that's not really what I call an artist and a DJ. Nowadays, it's the people who are successful are those ones. So for a real DJ, passionate DJ, three skills to be a DJ, it's getting very difficult if he doesn't know or if he can't be surrounded to communicate. So it's really difficult. And I think it's terrible. It's awful, to be honest. It's disgusting. I think today for the digital artist, it's the best moment to start. I don't know. I'm not saying it's easy. I think it's the best moment to start because this is the early foundations, even if digital art exists for such a long time, and I work with so many VJs along my career, Joanny Le Mercier recently reminds me that I invited him to play with me on stage 15 years ago through an old collective he had. But I do think the development of your generation, I think today is fantastic. You have so many tools, so amazing community that if you're authentic, true to yourself, and if you have something to say, because the most important is not to do an output, it's not to do something that is aesthetically nice, is to have something to say. That's the most important thing. If you have something to say, then you will do an output one day that will find this community. It's more about, as an artist, what do you want to express? And this is the most challenging thing. It, it has always been. For this, there is no difference. But digital art is such a trend 
that I don't think it's that difficult to start. I think it's difficult to maintain, to repeat yourself and to find your own character. This is the most difficult for sure. But also one thing, I guess, is I had this feeling also with music. When Ableton arrived, everybody was doing the same kind of music. And of course, with AI tools, everyone can do the same kind of things. So many people think it's easy to do good art with AI tools. I think it would get much more difficult because the accessibility of things make very difficult to do something relevant and different of others. So the time will tell, I guess. Thanks for sharing all those ideas. I agree. I think it's about being persistent and not chase the short term or the money in most cases. It's more about having something to say, as you said, and being able to put it out there and enjoy the process. Similar to the podcast, to be honest, and to these <laughs> spaces, it's about being persistent and enjoying the process, having this conversation with people, amazing people like yourself with such fresh takes. Seb, we passed the hour. It's been a pleasure to chat with you. I wanted to let you tell us a bit about your avatar collection that it's coming out on sandbox what are you saying with this collection and how can people find it i guess i mentioned a bit before it's the idea of we have more than one life and in our life how many lives do we want to live that's my question and i think living in paris i had the chance to get a good education and i had the chance to have access to many things but for so many people in the world this is not that easy they don't have access to all the culture, they don't have access to all the schools. I think the metaverse will help a lot. I'm sure for that. For this reason, this will be a fantastic way. For educational reason, for cultural reason, the metaverse will help. So my feeling is to question which identities we will have. And I guess the avatars will help for that. And how can, in a world where everyone can fake identities, your wallet will help you to show actually who you are really. Of course, the Agorians are more for fun because we take things so seriously in this space. It's also the Agorians is more okay. Do you want to have a Ibiza shirt? Do you want to have like the gay shirt? It's uh, all gender. There is all diversity. It's every culture is rep represented as I have in my parties and as I feel the life should be. It's more about a good vibe thing. I don't think it's a fine art project, of course, but it's a good vibe thing. It's a good community thing. Even if I have my dynamic approach of it to make it relevant artistically, so the avatars will switch every six hours. They are not static avatars. You have like the day and the night version. So as I said before, maybe by night you will be your true self. I don't know which one you will get. But it's very important for me that, of course, there is this artistic approach, not just put like my face. Of it. It's not a megalomaniac, of course, collection. It's more about actually questioning who is my second half and who could be yours. Nice. I love it. I love it. Where can I collect it? Is it in Sandbox or where can people actually collect it? Yes, it's actually a Sandbox collection, but we did an all list for all my collectors, all the Agorians since the last year or two years. We've been in touch with everyone, so everyone has been all listed. And then there is a public sale that will appear, I think, on the 30th. We will share the link. It's going to be on Sandbox, and then it will be on secondary market on OpenSea, I guess. Awesome. Final question, Agorian. This is always the hard one. Tricky for artists to answer. Uh, is, it, oh, is it the same one for everyone? I should have listened to the old postcard then. Shit. <laughs> well, actually, no, it's not like a rule, but I, I'm thinking about having it in every podcast because I get very interesting answers. So, probably from. Pressure, pressure, pressure. <laughs> so, can you name your top three favorite digital artists today? I will have a lot of enemies, and that's fine. My first one is actually Pierre Rigg. He's a digital artist, but I don't think he's very famous in the digital arts. I see a fantastic exhibition indeed at Fondation Luma in the south of France. And it was really incredibly well thinking. It was fantastic, really. He did work with an AI trying to reproduce what a human had in mind. And it was just incredibly well done. Pierre-Rick would be the first one. I, I spoke before about Joanie Le Mercier. I'm captivated by him as an artist, but also as a person because he's so engaged politically and so engaged for the ecology and is so brave in so many aspects. Sometimes when I take the planes too much in a week, I'm thinking about him who is like taking his bike and is so involved. I think Joanie Le Mercier is on top of being a great artist. 
is activism is something very specific, very special. I think I had to finish with Philippe Pareno because Philippe Pareno, I worked with him so much that it would not be very nice for me not to speak about him. Amazing, amazing lineup. I have to say there are more plasticians, maybe all the three artists. Right. Yeah, I know it's a tough question. There is Richard and I love him. Yeah, Richard Nadler. I love your AI collections. What you did at Verse was fantastic. It's great to, to see you here in the audience, Richard. And with that, I think we came to the end. It was a pleasure, Agoria. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for taking the time. No, it was my pleasure. Tour. Hope to see you soon. If you come to Spain, come to the north, one of your tours. <laughs> We'd love to see you. <laughs> yes, yes. I will come to Spain. I think I come to Madrid, actually, in two weeks. Right? Not in the north. So. No, it's not in the north. Let me also say one word for you because you're very important. That's also why I accept to do this podcast and take the time on a Monday when we're all back. I think what you do with this podcast and all your energy with your newsletter and all you did, like the feral process that you do with Reyes, and I forgot who it was, Melissa, I'm not sure who was the second one, but I think it's amazing because, as I said in this talk, it's not me or the collectors or the artists or the interview. We are all shaping together this. And I see DPZ here with a fantastic collector who did so much for the ecosystem since the beginning. All together, we make it uh, something very relevant. I want to say thank you for all the efforts you're doing because I know it's time was very difficult also because you were speaking about my time, but yours also is, I guess, quite demanded. So thanks a lot for that. Thanks. Thanks a lot. That means, means a lot. <laughs> Appreciate it and hope to talk to you soon. Agoria, have a, a great night. Thank you for everyone who listened. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.